glad for all of you to be here today. And uh, after that message this morning, I wanted to go out and find somebody from another nation here in Greenville and tell them about the Lord. Didn't you have that? Lord, let me speak to someone the gospel that doesn't have that from their background. And thank God for that message. Uh, we're glad to, to be with you together and we are needing a little of this to clear out so we can have some more room, right? But we're glad for you. And we're going to turn in our Bibles to Leviticus 16. We're going to do a kind of a combination. We've looked at the tabernacle and Christ in the Old Testament. We're now beginning to look at the feast. I will finish the feast series uh, next week, but I'm going to go into this one handout that I've given to you, and I want you to reflect on these things that are listed here on the Day of Atonement. That is the uh, seven, sixth feast of the Jewish calendar year. And the high priest was the only one that could go into the holiest of holies. You remember our diagram. And he did this once a year, and this describes some of what happened. But as we go into this, I want you to notice the different animals and the different types of sacrifice or manipulations and maneuvers that go on. So listen to it carefully as I begin in verse 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for sin offering and one for a ram offering, burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. Notice a bullock or a bull. He shall take of the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. We know where that's located. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And we've talked about that a little bit, about one is going to be sacrificed, the other one is going to be a picture of removing Israel's sin. One is the covering of the sin, the other one is the removal. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat in which the lot fell uh, to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off of the altar. Now that's the altar of sacrifice or slaughter literally is what it means the brazen altar you remember that so he's going to take calls from before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil okay and it, he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord and the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat so he's inside the veil with a cloud of smoke why is that so that he not directly look and gaze upon the glory of God and die. That's what we see. It says, so incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock. And by the way, that tradition that they tied a rope to the high priest may very well relate to this statement. We don't want to have to go in and retrieve our high priest who died because he did something wrong before the Lord because we might die going in to retrieve him. And that's really, a, there's a reverence there that sometimes we don't get as American Christians because we are, tend to be casual a lot of times in our worship. You know, God's our buddy here in America, but there's a, a missing of reverence to a certain degree, I think, that comes about because we have so easy access through the blood of Christ into God's presence, we sometimes forget the holiness of God. But he says, And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat. He's manipulating the blood or applying the blood, speaking of the fact that this is going to cover the law 
on the mercy seat and there's an atonement or a covering being made by the blood and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle of the blood with his fingers seven times and then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do that which uh, that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel because of their transgression and in all their sins and shall do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Now let me just say something. Where people are sinners, the place has to be sprinkled with the blood. Not just the mercy seat. And I want you to think about it. This is Jesus going to heaven with his blood in the reality of it the typology of it, and what's he doing? Sinners are up in heaven and the blood of Christ cleanses heaven because sinners contaminate heaven. Now I'm realizing you, our sin nature is going to be taken away, but there's a picture of this. Even heaven has to have the blood sprinkled upon it if sinners present. Now this gets, this gets us serious about what God is saying here. So I want to get your notes out now here. The Christ is seen in the sin sacrifices. We've just seen the Day of Atonement sin sacrifices. And I want to start out by reading. And in the Old Testament, a person bringing an animal sacrifice for sin would normally follow five steps. And I want you to note the five steps today in the bottom as we go through it. These six steps, the value of sacrifice would range from an expensive bull to the least expensive dove in all of the sacrifices. There were options and requirements. Why did the priest have to bring the most expensive animal that was sacrificed, that cost the most? The sacrifices, as opposed to others would bring a sin sacrifice for themselves, and it might be a dove. And people immediately answer that question in mind. It's because of the wealth. These are richer, and these are poor, and these poor people can't do it. Have you ever figured out why the difference? Why would this man for his house, and he as the high priest, have to bring a more expensive sacrifice than even the nation of Israel as a whole. Goats. I see some wheels turning. <laughs> you haven't thought about this, have you? Well, just read the rest of the paragraph, all right? The value of the animal to be sacrificed was determined by the degree of influence the sin or the sins had. Thus, there was a difference in the value between a high priest sin offering compared to a poor layman who did not have leadership influence. If a priest, the high priest, or a preacher today, put it in that category, me, anybody ordained in the ministry sins, does that have greater influence on people with that sin? Oh, it does. I remember whenever I challenged a hundred men in this room across about how to stay in love with your mate because of a sin of a leader that had been here at Morningside. And I remember one of our missionaries came up to me afterwards and said, oh, thank you, Pastor Miller. I had lost hope. If this man sinned and fell into this sin, I thought there's no hope for me. I can't stand it. He was discouraged and even convinced that he could not stay out of sin as a potential missionary because of a leader's example of going into sin. So I'm just going to say this. For us leaders... There is a high standard because we have a high influence. And that's why we often pray for our pastoral staff. God, don't let the devil stumble them. 
that will cause discouragement, that will cause division, people will leave the church and God's work will be heard and some people will drop out of church because of a pastor or an assistant pastor or a deacon's failure, right? Have you not seen that? And so that high priest had to have a more valued, higher priced, because his high influence. He was the spiritual leader. A prophet would fit in that category as well. You see what I'm saying? Now, we've got covered that, so we see this in Leviticus 16 for the Day of Atonement. We read through it, and so I've given you a foundation. Now let us consider the six basic steps to bring a God an offering for sin and what they mean. These were the sequential steps in the tabernacle that we've just had a study of. First of all, the person would have to go outside of the tabernacle and choose or select an animal appropriate for their sin offering. It might be a dove for some people. It might be a goat or a lamb for somebody. It might be a bull. Now, have you ever stopped to think about the cost of this? Most people didn't live within a five to ten mile radius where they could lead their goat or lead their bull to the temple. And this is what the money changers are all about in the temple. These people coming a great distance for Passover, you know, and Jesus comes in there and he cleanses the temple because they're charging exorbitant prices on the exchange from Roman money to Jewish money. An exchange rate that we, some people get into that too. Canada, our, do, uh, our son and daughter-in-law just bought a newer van, not a new van, all right, up in Calgary, Alberta. And I talked to uh, Michael, he's got about 250,000 miles on their old Odyssey and it serviced him well, but went to the shop and it's going to cost thousands of dollars. So you know that decision you have to make. Am I going to pour more money into this or I'm going to put it into payments for a new or a vehicle? So that, I think they got a 2017 or 18. Now, that's new for them, okay? But I said, Michael, we, could we get you one down here and it'd be better, you know? He says, no, the exchange rate, the Canadian dollar is only 70 some cents worth to a dollar of American. And we, that would cause us more cost. Well, that's what was happening with the money changers. They were exchanging the money that people were bringing from a distance. It was Roman money or Greek coinage or whatever they came from and getting Jewish money to be able to buy or give a money offering or whatever in the temple. And they were ripping God's people off on the exchange rate, making it a great profit off of religion. But they also, what is Bethlehem known before besides David growing up there and Ruth coming back there with Naomi and and Jesus being born there, what is it really known to for the Jews? Pardon? House of bread. Do you realize that shepherds keeping their sheep by watch at night? These were many lambs that were being raised and they were perfect without blemish and taken to the temple. And people that came a distance bought them there outside the temple. Okay, we've got that. So the first step is you got to choose one. And what you do is you go and you look, well, that one's not too big. Maybe I can get it for cheaper money. <laughs> that one's, ah, it's got a, it's got a plain leg. I, they'll give me a good deal on it. No, you don't do that. It had to be no broken bones, no blemishes, no disease. And what is that picture? Yeah, Christ. And you know the passage, don't you? In 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 19, it says, You're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. From your vain conversation, your empty life of religious tradition, received from your traditions of your father, but with something else. 
the precious blood of Christ, of a lamb without spot and without blemish. And so it was a sin against God to take the type and make it cheap. You know, the minor prophets, you find this coming up over and over again. Hey, how have you shown me a, a, a disreverence, if you could use that term, a lack of reverence? They said, we, we haven't shown you a lack of reverence. God, and the prophet says, oh yes, you brought the lamed and the maimed and, and the cheap stuff, and that misrepresents Christ, my Messiah that's going to come. He's the spotless Lamb of God. Mm. And so they got into trouble in the Old Testament hundreds of years before Christ came because they were misrepresenting Christ the Messiah, the spotless Lamb of God. So your selection is you're going to get the best and the most expensive that represents what God did. God got the best He had. His Son, spotless, and took Him to the temple precinct area. But we see here laying on of the hands unto the animal by the person offering the sacrifice speaks of transferal of guilt. And the word in the Hebrew for laying on hands is not just, well, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. No, it literally means to lean your weight on something. And what does that speak of? Well, the image that God had to, son had to bear the weight of our sins. When the sins are transferred to Him. So this is a leaning on that animal. Pushing it down. And it's the image of transferal of guilt. That's why it had to be done. It's not just identifying with it. It's I'm taking that which I'm guilty for and liable for punishment. And I'm, this is my substitute. I'm putting it on this lamb or this goat or this bull. Okay, and so that's what the offerer had to do, laying his hands onto the animal. And what does Isaiah 53 say? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Yes, and all we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And you know what the essence of iniquity really is? Iniquity is just defined in the previous statement in Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every way unto our own way. Our own way is the heart of iniquity. My way. You know, it's kind of like the little baby in the high chair. Me. Me do it. You know, it's my way. No, I don't need you. <laughs> and that's the way we treat God, don't we? So many times. That's the heart of our iniquity. That's the essence of it. And 1 Peter 3.18, we want to turn there. You know, some of you are familiar with Ed Nelson and uh, from South Sheridan. And this is one of his favorite verses in How to Witness to Souls, a little pamphlet. And he would use it in his witness. Uh, I like the Romans road. Oftentimes I use that, but it's good to tailor make it. But 1 Peter 3.18 pictures this, what was happening whenever this innocent animal, having done no sin, is now getting the transfer of guilt of the officer, officer over to the sacrifice of this lamb. Let's look at it. Verse 18 says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins. He just had to do it once. He's the just. He's the righteous one. He's the innocent one. For the unjust. In the place. So this is talking about substitutionary sacrifice. In my place. Jeff? That's a good verse for Catholics. Yes. Once. Because they kill them every time they do the. On Sundays. The Mass. Once. You talk to Catholics and you say, have, have you ever received Christ? Oh, every Sunday. He sacrificed every Sunday. Now, once he suffered. 
And it says that he might bring us to God, to get us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. What a great verse. But that's what we're talking about there, laying on the hands the just for the unjust. All right, and then we see when they would come, the next step would be the offerer slaying the animal. Now, how would you like to be in that religious system that God required? Some of you can't kill a flea. You don't want to. But you got now this animal. And maybe you raised it. And you're within five miles of the temple. And you bring it and you fed it. And now you're going to take a knife and slit its throat. Right there. In front of that altar. It's a picture. Yeah. I remember the day when it hit me. My sins mm -hmm. slayed Christ. My sins that wounded, bruised, that word has to do with crush. Slay and crush mm -hmm. by my guilt being put on Him. You know, one of the debates I remember coming up is our Jewish a tour guide over in Israel this last time I was over there and I can't remember exactly where it was I think it was on the hill up by Nazareth where they tried to shove Jesus off the cliff when he said this day Isaiah 61 has been fulfilled I'm here I'm the Messiah and they his own city people that he grew up with we're going to throw him off of that cliff. And they took us to that cliff. But our Jewish knew the Bible. But one of the things he wanted to say right there. It says, now some people have it wrong. They think, they tell us we're guilty for killing Christ. That Jesus that you believe in. No, we didn't do that. Well, in a sense, he's right. And now the, the Roman soldiers got involved. The Jewish leaders got involved. But let me tell you something. Our sins are what put him there. And that's what this pictures. He had it placed on him. And that's what we're looking at. So the slaying of the animal. By the one needing forgiveness. Points out the penalty of sin is death. The fact that that lamb had to die. The fact that Christ had to die means the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, yes, by death, is eternal life. Shedding of the blood, slitting the throat, that means taking the life from the person because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so Romans 5.8 says, God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. And the preposition for means in our place. In behalf of us. I remember using this verse and witnessing to a lady back in the late 70s. I was pastoring out of Clemson in the country. And there was a girl in our church that was dating a boy that her mom attended. And he attended. And she was, got saved. But then she came to me one day and said, you've got to go talk to my dad. My dad has left my mom and has gone to another woman and he's unsaved and I want you to go talk to him. So where can I find him? Well, she gave me a place where he was building a new home for his second wife that he had just taken, leaving her mother. And I remember taking a ministerial student from Bob Jones who was doing an internship with us and going to that building that afternoon and we caught him there. And we went through the Romans Road. He's 55. He grew up in this area and had never heard the gospel. And I, and I asked him at the Romans 10, 13 invitation time if he wanted to receive Christ. And he said, I got one question. If I get saved, do I have to go back to my first wife? Now, that's a legitimate question. I said, no. Deuteronomy tells you it would be wrong for you to play back and forth between women. That was forbidden. Once a man divorced, a woman gave her a bill of divorcement and one of them went on to be married to someone else, they couldn't come back. And it was like he was relieved, okay? <laughs> I don't know. And, and, but, but 
That day he genuinely received Christ. And his wife and his children, the last time I knew they were in a fundamental Baptist church down there going on for the war. They didn't feel comfortable to come to our church because of the connection of his daughter there and having left his wife, but he got a new life in Christ and a new start. And I remember going that Wednesday then to her, her mother because she was burdened about her mother. And so on the way to prayer meeting, I stopped at the mother's place going to witness until she hated that man her husband, leaving her, anger all over. And I was going through the Romans road and I said, don't you realize God loves you so much? He died in your place. Oh, what that man did. I said, let me just tell you how that love works. You've got five children. Would you be willing to take your, one of your children out in the backyard here, put them on a cross, and crucify your child if you knew that killing of that child would take care of the sins of the neighborhood you live in. Goes, oh no! I, I couldn't do that. I said, you don't love your neighbors like God loves us. He's willing to take His own Son. That's how much He loved us and see that He died in our place. She didn't get saved, but months later I found out God's love tendered her heart and she came to the Lord. But the love of God, God showed us His love so much that Christ died in our place. Our sins killed Him. Okay? He didn't say, you change your way. No, while we were yet sinners, He died for us. He didn't say, reform your life, did He? He saved us in our sin. And even... Before we sin, you know, when people, I witnessed to him, I said, do you realize when Jesus died for you, all your sins were future. Your future sins are not going to keep you from getting saved and being still saved. He died for the past, present, and future sins. But then we go on to this next one where we look at this. The plying of, by, by the way, I probably ought to go to it. Romans, uh, no, let's go to 1 Peter 2.24. That, that kind of finalizes it about Christ left us as an example. And by the way, I'm tired and my tang is getting tangled up this morning because I'm trying to go too fast, all right? 1 uh, Peter. And it, it talks about in verse 21 that in this 1 Peter 2 that Christ left us an example because he suffered for us. And then he comes down to verse 24 and he says, who his own self bore our sins. Once again, the weight of our sins on him. In our place, our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now, we're going to go to Verse, uh, step number four, applying the slain animal's blood, not by the offer. He's done, he's slain, but the priest now has to apply the blood. And so from this own point, the stuff that's done is the priest. Now Jesus, in the fulfilling of this type, he is both the sacrifice and the priest. Stop and think about that. He fulfills both. He's the offering that got slain and now he's the one that is applying the blood where it needs to be applied. To cover our sins. To present it before God the Father so we can be acceptable in His sight at the mercy seat or the throne of God. You got that picture? Alright. And so this is the next stage of it. So... He applies the slain animal's blood. And the high priest on the Day of Atonement, where did he go? He went inside the veil after the censer smoke covered it so he didn't get killed. And he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat and in front of it. Seven times the number of what? Yeah, the number of perfection or completion. It's done. It's completed. The blood covers the mercy seat. And so we see this, applying the slain animal's shed blood by the priest pictured that the shedding of Christ's blood 
was giving of his life to satisfy the holy and just wrath of God for sin. At the altar of a judgment that happened, but now it's going to heaven. Romans 3, let's turn there. And we maybe will finish with this, and I hope we can get a little more today. But Romans 3, Romans 3. This is what I want you to look at because many times we quote, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that's the verse we know in Romans 3, isn't it? But there's, there's something that follows just is beautiful after that. And so Romans chapter 3, he comes down to verse 24 and continues the thought that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, missed the mark, fallen short of God's sinless perfection. And then he begins into how we get this thing applied to us that we need so desperately. And he says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption. The payment has been paid. The payment was his blood. That's what it means to do is redeem is to buy someone or pay for something. That is in Christ Jesus, who God has set forth to be a propitiation. Propitiation is a big word. Most of you can't spell it and most of you can't pronounce it. But it, it means this. It's simply the payment, the sacrifice that satisfied the holy wrath of God against sin. Propitiation is the sin offering, the sacrifice, the shedding of the blood that takes care of the holy wrath of God against sin. God can't just say, well, I'm a good God and I love, and I love everybody, and it doesn't matter what they do. No. He's a holy God. He's just. And that sin has to be paid for and taken care of. And then it says, the result of that declared his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. At the cross, Jesus was taking care of all of those believers' sins of the past. And we know those present and the future. Through God's forbearance, he hadn't judged those people of the Old Testament because Christ was coming to pay for it. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, God's righteousness, his being holy and fair at the same time, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God lost none of his holiness, none of his justice, when he gets at Christ. It made him just to be able to forgive people. Because he had seen to it that the payment has been made for us. That his holy sinlessness demanded punishment and death. And he killed his son. He wounded him. Our sins wounded him. But in essence, God really killed his son. Like Abraham up on Mount Moriah lifting that. That was a picture of what God the Father was going to do with God the Son. And we, you remember when we talked about the angel of the Lord saying the Lord will provide a ram. And that was Christ incarnate. Christ was there on Mount Moriah saying in years to come, there's going to be someone march up on that. And that's me, the ram. That my father is going to provide. Well, we made a little progress today. <laughs> Aren't you thankful for Amen. our Savior? Yes, and we just have to glory in him and share him with everybody else. We ought to go out this week and brag on him to people every time we get a chance. You know, that's really what witnessing is. Witnessing, say, I want, I'm going to tell you something. You know, sometimes you say, well, I've got a son, he's a great athlete. And I could tell you guys, my grandson, somebody said, he's, he ought to go play college volleyball. He's so good. I could brag about that, but let me tell you something. There's something better than bragging on your <coughs> grandson. And that's bragging on your Savior. Because he's done the most and is the best that you and I will ever have. Well, let's close in prayer. Brother Dave Brown, would you close us in prayer? Sure.
Father, this morning we thank thee for the so great salvation by the Lord for us through your Son. While we may be ever mindful of the great sacrifices given for our sins, we might have eternal life. Well, I pray that you bless, Lord, the lesson to our hearts. Help us to take it and use it. And as Brother Tony says, go out and brag on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Guide and direct in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.